Me. Since the war, Travis had lived in Chelsea. She sent Walt Disney a photograph of her house in Smith Street as a guide for his scenic artists. But by 1964, she'd bought this house in Shawfield Street, where she lived until her death in 1996. This room is where she did all her writing. It was a very special place for her, and very few people came up here. She went to Japan. She was very, very interested in the whole Buddhist side of the Japanese. This photograph here of Ivanovich Gurdjieff, who had a, a great influence on her. This she found very helpful to her when she needed to be still. My mother was very fond of that. I think because she bought it so cheaply. Only five pounds in the King's Road. She always had an eye for a bargain. And Pamela kept telling her friends, her female friends, that she wanted to adopt a baby and they said, you're mad, this is crazy, you can't adopt a baby, but she was determined to. So she learnt through her Irish literary circle that a baby might be available. I always knew there was something funny going on. I did. Because my mother was so nervous. And I ha had only to look into my passport. What was this peculiar name? What? So she went to... Ireland, and she found this little baby uh, who was a twin. And he was the grandson of Yeats's biographer, Joseph Hone. My grandfather said, take both, they're small. But for some reason, I think it was a mistake. And certainly my twin brother does. I think she should have taken both of us. And so you have to ask yourself the question, why take one? It's too important pose yourself upon one, which you possibly couldn't do on two. She thought, here we've got a little bit of island that I can have in a flower pot and uh, watch it grow and let's see what happens. And the more I insisted upon knowing the truth, the more my mother went into a shell and went abroad and sent me to boarding school. She was trying to avoid the inevitable, which was me knowing the truth. When I was very young, she said, oh, your father died in the tropics. Which, of course, was her father. My father was still alive, but she didn't tell me that. <laughs> Pierre Travers had studied with Mr. Gurdjieff in Paris. She was very, very enthusiastic about this center for the Gurdjieff work. He found that there were so many um, ways in the East that were passing on messages, passing on stories through movement. Pamela studied these movements for years, and that may be from the study of these movements that she brought this dance into her books. Another thing about Travers, which is particularly interesting for me as a choreographer, is her constant reference to dance. I mean, this was in a big appeal when I started to read the books because her, her reference to and relationship between flying and dancing, it's the nearest you can get to flying. The whole metaphysical side that underpinned her writing was very, very important to her, and she lectured 
um, across America about it. When I was in Arizona living with the Indians for two summers during the war, they gave me an Indian name. And they said, we give you this so that you will never, never tell it to to anybody. Anybody can know your other name, but this name must never be spoken, and we never spoke to it from that day to this. There is something very strange and mysterious about one's name. I myself always tremble when people I don't know very well take my Christian name. I tremble inside. I don't like it. She spent two summers with the Navajo Indians who made this jewelry, and she wore these bracelets and this necklace every day of her life that I knew her. I was the assistant librarian in the Central Children's Room in 1972 when Pamela Travers came. She had brought her toys. She always had them in the mantle and then she put them in the nursery, she told us. Now stay awake. Don't rush your head. Don't lie down upon your bed, Papa the boy. While the moon lives in the sky, because they will work to close your eyes. Now, all these are related to the books. She used them for inspiration. Travers gave this doll to her illustrator, Mary Shepherd, as a model for Mary Poppins. It wasn't just the objects around her that she wrote into her stories. She also delved into her own unconscious, her inner world, for her books. And she practiced, I think, this descent into another world, full of the, of the archetypes, full of the wisdom of the unconscious. She was uh, very at home there. You can see that in the writing. There is the elements of all the great tales that we love woven in to a, you know, to a, into a brilliant new fabric. In books like What the Bee Knows and About the Sleeping Beauty, Travers explored the meaning of myths. She also helped set up a magazine on the subject called Parabola. Among her many articles, she once described her own method of writing. I sit down inside my abdomen and brood and brood till I find out what I feel about it. And she says what she's doing is going into a painful memory. She's bringing up in herself a painful memory. Just what was that painful memory that sparked her writing and that she tried so hard to protect even from beyond the grave? She left very strict instructions that she, there was to be no memorial service for her, no biography should be written about her, nobody was to discuss her after her death. If you don't want your life to be written about, you don't keep anything. I mean, that's the basic rule. Throw everything out, burn it, destroy it. If you keep things, somebody might come along one day and want to write about you. In part three, we travel halfway around the world to discover the secrets of her earliest childhood. In September, the musical Mary Poppins started a six-week tryout in Bristol prior to its London opening. Travers, we always say